I think uh, there's a lot of people out there now putting themselves under a quarter of a million dollars worth of debt to get a college degree to be serving me a cappuccino in Starbucks next week. Um, <laughs> it's true. It's, it's a shame. There's a lot of ways. See, I class myself, I, I left school at the age of 15 years old, okay? I uh, left the age of 15. At 21 years old, I went to Hong Kong to work on the door. Um, and I so I had no college. I had no university. But I've spoken in the Pentagon and lectured at Harvard twice. I class myself as an educated man, but school had nothing to do with it. So college is not where you get the only education you will ever need. It's where you get some basics. And if you can get those basics somewhere else, go and find them somewhere else. This is the Real Talk University podcast, where your hosts, Andre and Christian, Explore success stories outside of the classroom. Why do you think it's important for anyone out there our age to build a network early on? Because networks are dying. Um, you see, the one thing is that, you know, you're the other side of America to me. I'm in Los Angeles. You're in like, you know, where the heck are we or wherever it is you said. Um, and uh, the bottom line of it is we're different age groups. We're, free, we're even different age demographics. We're different cultures. But the fact still remains that as human beings, we yearn to connect. We are hungry for information. We are hungry for connectivity, for relatability. And the trouble is we're in a society where that's actually diminishing. We're seeing the top of people's heads more and more and more. We get people go, oh, I've got 5,000 friends on Facebook. You don't know 5,000 people. You know, you fall over on your ass. How many of those people are going to come and help you? You know, especially on Facebook when you've still got your picture up when you're freaking 13 years old and now <laughs> you're 62. So it's just ridiculous the society we're in. And I think, no, let me rephrase that. I know for a fact the only reason I'm able to call people like Elton John, Richard Branson, is because I have relationships and I come with value. Some of the time that value is quite simply just a big checkbook. But I have a reason to reach out and connect with these people. And as we move into a transactional society and everything has been amazon we're losing that one-on-one -on -one relationship. So I think, yeah, you've got to focus on it. At the end of the day, you boys, you're going to be looking for a partner. You're going to be looking for mates. You're going to be looking for a pack of people that you relate to. None of that shit's ever going to change because we're human beings. But for some reason, people think it is going to change. If you think about it, statistically, we've only just started freaking walking upright. We are the slowest evolving technology in the damn planet. So communication is not just really important to us. It's critical for our survival. True. And I think that kids in our generation kind of sit behind their cell phone screens and only know how to interact based on like texting. So for anyone out there that's kind of awkward or not really good at networking in person, what strategies would you give to them for kind of face-to-face -face conversation? Well, the good thing is you guys are lucky little shits um, because everyone loves to bash on the millennials, okay? Sponging wasters, little snowflakes that like to throw up a banner every Saturday morning and protest on shit they don't understand. That is the beautiful little veil that you guys are hiding behind. And good on you, because all the time people think you're this, you could be focusing on being that. So you've got the upper hand, because everyone's expectations of millennials is already low. So well done, you fooled the world. I think what you've got to do is you've got to just get used to talking to people. I went to a restaurant the other day, and it was really cool. And funny enough, I think this actually started in New York but I was in LA. When you got to your table, there was a little cardboard box and it was the phone. I think this was called the phone dump and everyone put their phones in it and it just sat on the edge of the table. And if you, if you walk into a Starbucks, two things happen. The person orders the Starbucks, they step over to the side and then they do this. <laughs> it's so they, true. It is. They hide behind it. Have you noticed? Have either of you guys ever boxed? No. no. <laughs> right, I okay. watched it. You've watched it, and that's good enough. 
let, let me put it this way. If I came at you guys and I started to punch you, what would your natural reaction, your natural stance be? Bingo. Now, before, before we joke about that, and I know we're on a podcast, so let's explain. You just pulled your hands up to protect your head, okay? Think of the stance you take when you're on the phone, okay? It's identically defensive, isn't it? It's the same thing. It's like you're <laughs> defending Ain't yourself, you? yeah. From Big, you're defending yourself from interaction. You're defending yourself from any ability for anyone to get close to you. You're closed up. There's absolutely no difference with you having your guard up on a boxing match and stood in Starbucks checking your emails. And it puts you into that mental state of defensiveness. We should, you, yeah, yeah. You try this weird shit idea. because it's, <laughs> it's crazy, all right? Next time you go in and you order a coffee, leave your phone in your pocket, okay? Yeah. And just look around, and I'll tell you what's going to happen is weird. You're going to make eye contact with someone, and it's going to freak them the fuck out, okay? <laughs> it, will, it will make them nervous, okay? Because we're losing that interactability, aren't we? Okay? Or when you're with a buddy of yours, shove your phone in your pocket, leave it in your pocket, and the second he br brings his phone out, say to him, whoa, am I not interested enough? You know? Is there something more exciting for you to be doing? Because, dude, we can do this another night and just get people to start putting the phones down. And I'm seeing a shift. You know, we've seen, especially the younger generation, we're starting to see them move off of Facebook, okay? More and more we're seeing them move off of Facebook. More and more we're seeing them move off of social. But the trouble is, they're still thirsty and hunger for where they can go for that kind of little nosy voyeurism into the other world of everyone's insta-perfect shit. But if you can actually start putting that phone down and actually focusing on the unfiltered world, you actually find out it's pretty cool. And you'll be amazed that when you talk to people and, and start conversations when you're in Lyft or you're in your Uber, just go, hey man, how's the night going? Is it a good night for you? Tips doing well? You know, just, and it sounds daft, but start a conversation. Now, if you want to see this in absolute MBA, bachelor, Harvard degree status, go into a bar and watch a barmaid or a barman work at a high quality bar. Now, this may sound a bit weird. And I don't know how, how old are you guys? 16, 18, 20? 19, what are you? 19. 19. 19. So you shouldn't be hanging around in bars. But anyway. When you get the chance to, and you could do this in hotels, okay? So there's the excuse. When you go into this kind of bar, you will see the bar person react to people in a split second differently. They will see a couple of older guys in suits, and they will say, good afternoon, sirs. How are we doing? What, what can I get you? What's your pleasure this afternoon? And then I see a group of girls that are all tired up, ready for a night out, and they'll be like, Hey, ladies, you ready for fun tonight? The bar person reacts super duper fast. And their ability to connect and relate. Why? Because A, to relate and connect, they're going to get a bigger tip. And the communication is we want to make sure we get you the best what you want. We want to get you your best drink. And so bar staff are absolutely phenomenal at communicating and rapidly changing pace depending on who they're actually talking to. It's a science. Absolutely. I think for me personally, like getting out there and talking to people like my Uber driver or my taxi driver or whatever, like making connections with them for the 10 minutes that I'm with them is really fulfilling. Just seeing how their day is going, getting to interact with them. And um, I think it kind of- surprised? Uh, so normally they initiate it because they want obviously the bigger tip, but like it's fun to just sit there and talk to them. It's just way more like, I would rather do that than sit there in silence staring at my phone. It's just awkward. You see, and that's the problem. When your face is down, the world's going the other way. It's going past you. You're missing out. Um, and if you start having conversations with people, there will be people to kind of look at you freaking weird. And they're like, you know, why are you talking to me? And you could just say, yeah, cool shoes, you know, or just whatever, just to start a conversation. I was in a, um, and I, you know, this, is, uh, this isn't on video. Are you releasing this on video or just podcast? We're, we're going to do both, both eventually. All right. So anyone that's watching this on video gets to see what I look like. And anyone that doesn't see it on video, 
I'm just like Brad Pitt, you know, it's very, the similarities are uncanny. But the, the truth of the fact is, I'm not the kind of guy you actually want to meet walking down the street at about 12 o'clock at night. Let's be blunt, all right? So for me, to be able to be warm and fuzzy and talk to people can sometimes make them feel a bit uncomfortable. But when you connect with people and you start talking to them, they almost feel surprised that you're talking to them. And then the next level, uh, the next wave comes in is relief and excitement that they're actually connecting with someone. Right. So it's a weird thing to get over. And I was in, um, I was in London and I was doing, as I mentioned to you, I live in Los Angeles. I left England when I was 21. Um, and I was back in England like about five years ago. And I was being interviewed because they'd seen me with some powerful people in Monaco. And I was well known. I think Forbes called me the real life Wizard of Oz. So they wanted to do this this uh, interview on me for a breakfast TV show. And this guy's going through it and he's going, oh, and you've done this and we've seen you with this person and you're connected with that. And we hear that you did this in the Vatican. He's blowing me up like crazy. And I'm just sitting there on the edge of the sofa with a camera's going, yeah, that's cool. Keep it coming. Good branding. <laughs> I'm going to do well out of this. And then he turns around and he says, you know, and you're, the, you're, old, you're also an ultimate communicator. And I suddenly realized that no, I'm not. I'm not a brilliant communicator, but I look good because no one else is doing it. And that actually depressed me. I, I physically came off of that show, gut-wrenchingly depressed, that I was looking brilliant because everyone else was becoming so shit at a basic fundamental of talking to each other. Now, you guys don't have kids. But when you look around at a schoolyard, especially when they're under the age of like four, okay, they run into the schoolyard and they run off and they play with who they want to play with. They don't give a shit about culture, politics, um, anything that's politically correct. They don't care about your views on Trump or anything. They have no care. They just want to go and play with who they want. And then it's the parents to go, Oh, what about little Billy over there? Why don't go and play with him? He's on his own. And the kid's are like, screw you. Those are my friends over there. But we as parents, we force them to go and do what they don't want to be doing. And then as we get older, communication gets confusing. I say, bring it back. Stop apologizing. Just hang around with people that you like, you relate to, you get on with, and put your phones down. Right. I just have a quick off-topic question. How tall are you? That is so off topic. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm just under six, like five, five, okay. eleven. Because you said you wouldn't be the guy you'd want to see on the street. So I was just wondering if you were like the six four dude. So, but no, um, I, I'm, I'm five foot eleven, two hundred and forty five pound. Um, you know, bald, goatee, piercings, tattoos, all that kind of pretty stuff. A beast, a beast. Also, one thing I was going to say is networking, like when you're talking to anyone, you never know where the conversation is going to lead to. You never know what opportunities are going to open up from it. Never know. You, and that's, that's where the real gold is, you know, being able to just talk to people. Now, networking, focusing on that a second, networking is not where you go running around a room just trying to get people's phone numbers and business cards. Networking is connecting and finding, and joking aside, years, years later, when I look back at the podcasts I've done and I see this podcast, I'm going to remember the guy that randomly just asked me how tall I was, okay? I'm, I'm going to remember that because I've never been asked how tall I am on a podcast, okay? So that's going to stand out. But you know, that's what makes you stand out. So when you're in a room and everyone's kind of like, Hey, how are you? Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. And you're in an art gallery, you know? Everyone wants to talk about art. Why don't you turn around and go, the traffic was shit getting here. How far <laughs> did you have to travel? You know, just, it's, it's that, how tall are you? It's a question that's not normally asked. Now, I've been in rooms, and I've wanted to communicate with people because there's a deal that I want or they are, a celebrity that I'm trying to get close to. I, I go in with laser focus. I see the person I want to talk to. They walk up to the bar. I walk up to the bar next to them and I'll order a drink. And if they order a drink, there's anything other than just wine 
champagne, or just a single syllable drink, then if they order, I don't know, a Manhattan with a twist, you know, I'll turn around and I'll go, what the hell's that? And they'll look at me and they'll be like, well, what the hell's a Manhattan with a twist? Never heard of it. And just get them to tell you what it is. The good thing is, you're asking a question which is this short, they've now got to answer this big. So it starts the communication and they're doing the ones talking. I've stood next to people before and I've looked down, I've gone, they are some bloody fine shoes you got there. Where'd you get the shoes from? <laughs> and just started with shoes. Um, and it's kicked off conversations. And you know, funny enough, and I mentioned that thing about the shoes, I've still got a client of mine like nine years later and in every cocktail story, when, when he's been introducing me to new people, he'll introduce me as the shoe guy. Oh, this is Steve. Be <laughs> careful. He's got a fascination about shoes. You know, just, I, it, was just, it was just an angle to get in. But this guy has locked and loaded. And remember that the first time we met was because I was chatting him up about his shoes. That's crazy. So, yeah, kind of shifting gears into more of the companies that you've started. Tell us about how you started Bluefish. So Bluefish, I, I didn't start, funny enough. Um, it kind of grew organically. Uh, when I was on the door, I knew full well I wanted to be off the door. I knew full well I wanted to knock around with rich people. So knowing where all the clubs were was my access into a rich people's playground. So I started getting them into clubs. Then I started taking over the clubs and throwing my own parties. Then I started taking over penthouses and yachts. Then I started connecting with like big award shows and Formula One and Polo and Milan Fashion Week. So instead of me making the event, I would piggyback someone else's event. All the time I was doing this, my sole focus was to build up a Rolodex of affluent, powerful people. That was the whole thing I was focused on. And as I was building it up, I would send out, just as a bit of a joke, I would send out passwords to get into these events. So I would tell you to wire 10 grand to get into my party in Milan and you would wire 10 grand and I'd send you back uh, a fax or an email telling you what the password is. So you would turn up at the event and you would say, now we had loads of different passwords, but they were all kind of like kiddie things. Like when you turned up, you had to name two of the Teletubbies. Or when you turned up, you had to name the lion out of the lion, the witch and the wardrobe. Okay, and that, got, that caught a lot of people off. Bearing in mind, a lot of people didn't have cell phones back in the late 90s and the early 2000s uh, with the search ability that we have now. Um, but one of the other ones was I used to love Dr. Zeus uh, poems. So it was, finish this sentence, one fish, two fish, red fish. So people would walk up to the adornment and they'd go, <laughs> and they would get in. And... When it started happening, then people started asking us, oh, can you do this? Can you do that? And we said, yeah. Then people started coming, looking for us, going, hey, where's that Bluefish company? And I remember actually someone coming up to me once asking me, because I was on the door of my own party, so they didn't possibly think I owned it. And they turned around to me and they went, who's the Bluefish company? I said, what Bluefish company? And I was thinking, is it a, a, um, a yacht charter? Is it a fishing expedition? I had no idea what these people were talking about. And they went, oh, yeah, yeah, they did the party the other day. And I'm thinking, no, they didn't. I did that. So, and for a while, I actually thought there was a company out there taking credit for my party until one of the team actually told me, no, 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 that's the, that's the password we had that night. I was like, oh, yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> so we literally realized by demand, it's like you doing a, a, I don't know, cooking a bunch of muffins that everyone really, really likes. Before you know it, you're in business. I just found a way of removing the bullshit, keeping things impossible to misunderstand, and getting people what they wanted. And quite simply, people loved it and wanted it, and they paid for it. And the password became the name and, and that's how it started. And as I say, it went from, I need to get into a really cool nightclub in Hong Kong to how do I get into the star studded Oscar parties? And along the way, people went, well, I don't want to go to the party. I want to throw my own one and I want Beyonce to turn up and sing for me. Or I want to visit the Pope at the Vatican. Or I want to have um, lunch with Donald Trump or Mark Burnett or Oprah Winfrey or any of these other people that we've handled. 
You know, it just, it just grew into this uh, wish fulfillment that it is now. So how, how in the world do you go about like calling the Oscars and say, get so-and-so in, or can this person at Beyonce come to their party? Like, how, how do you make those calls? You don't. The, uh, the first answer to that question is you don't. So uh, here's the scoop. If I don't know you, and I walk up to you in a restaurant and I shake your hand and I go, hey, how you doing? I've had people ask me to get them married in the Vatican by the Pope, send them down to the Titanic, sing on stage with a rock band. You're instantly going to think I'm arrogant, I'm precocious, I'm full of it, because uh, it's branding, it's self-pushy. Um, you're not going to be receptive to that information. Even though it's all true, you're not going to be receptive to it because you don't want me pushing it down your throat. But here's the, here's the flip side. If I'm walking through a party and your buddy taps you on the shoulder and goes, you see that good looking dude over there? He's actually got people married in the Vatican. If he says the exact same thing, word for word, it's gospel, isn't it? It's credible. It's reliable. So whenever I need to get to somebody, I look in my Rolodex, and this is where relationships and communication is so imperative. I look in my book and I go, who do I know that could possibly know that person? And I, I get them to make the phone call for me. So by the time I phone you up, you've already had an introduction from someone that you trust and you rely on. So yes. if I want to get a hold of Beyonce, I don't know Beyonce firsthand, but I've worked with Elton John for eight years. So if I wanted to get hold of Beyonce, I could phone up Elton John's camp and go, make a phone call for me. All of a sudden, she gets a phone call from Elton John's people, and I'm credible. Yeah, that's crazy. So, so from my understanding, that book that you're talking about, the Rolodex, is called the Black Book, because we, we actually developed something ourselves with all the people we, we've got interviews with. We kind of took after you and, and have this like organized spreadsheet of contacts and names of people we've come across and did interviews with. I'll tell you, that list of yours that you're building, you keep building it for 10 years, that'll be more valuable than Bitcoin. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, that's, where, that's where all the money is in relationships. The amount of times I've been able to now, because of my relationships, send just a video text going, hey, uh, I've got someone who wants to do this. Can you help me out? And because of the relationship I've got, before you know it, big doors are opening up and I'm pulling it off. You know, I've got people wanting to meet, uh, literally, as of today, I've got people contacting me going, hey, I want to meet players from the Rams. I want to meet Brady. I want to meet the Patriots. I want to be down on the front line. I want to run on field. I want to be on the field on halftime show. I want to be all the after party. We can handle all of that because of the relationships we have. So we've literally just been texting, email, phoning all day to make sure it happens. And then bearing in mind, we've got the Grammys in two weeks, uh, two and a half weeks' time. Then you've got your Super Bowl, actually vice versa, I think. And then you've got uh, the Oscars. Um, it's, just, it's just crazy. And if we didn't have the relationships we have, none of that stuff would be happening. So, so how do you quote these people? Like, how, how do you come up with, like, an appropriate price? Is it fixed or is it – I mean, obviously not fixed because it, it varies depending on the, the job, but – it does, but I actually base it on the length of term that it's taken me to build a relationship up, okay? You see, you're not paying me for how long it takes me to send a text. You're paying me for how long it's taken me to get into the position to be able to send that text. So if I've got a relationship that's taken me six months to build up, maybe it's 10%, okay? If I've got someone that I've known for 20 years and he never takes any phone calls, but he took mine, then maybe you're on 50%, maybe you're on 100%, you know? So it's based on the fact of how likely in your lifetime are you going to be able to have the relationship that I have in order for you to be able to get what you want. Yeah, that's genius, actually. So, so going back to Bluefish and when you first started, what was the first gig you ever did for someone through that company, if you could recall? Uh, well, it happened before, the, before we actually called it Bluefish. Um, I, and it was the first... It was the first shock that made me realize that there's a business here, okay? Um, so I was on the door of one of the nightclubs and these four guys came up that had been to the clubs loads of times. 
They'd been to all my private parties. I didn't have a party going on at the time. I'm working on the door. They turn up and they came up and they went, oh, are you going to the yacht party tonight? Now, Hong Kong, I was in Hong Kong at the time. Hong Kong is, a, is, a, is actually a remarkably small island and it's full of harbors, okay? I didn't know which harbor he was talking about. So I went, oh, I don't know, you know, which one you all about? And he told me which one he was going on about. And I went, oh, I don't know if I can be bothered. I didn't even know there was a party going on. I knew nothing, you know? So I'm like, oh, I don't even know if I'm going to go. So they go into the club and I turned around to my buddy that was on the door and I went, hold it down for a while. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just go off a bit. So I took a little cab ride over to the harbor and I went down there and that's setting this yacht up. It's about eight o'clock in the evening, maybe quarter away. It was pretty early. And uh, I walked up to the, uh, to the girl and there's this girl there with a flip chart, losing her head. She's already starting to freak out like a little chicken. And I went up there and I was like, excuse me, excuse me. And she like turned around and uh, I said, hey, I said, uh, uh, I don't want to interrupt because I know it's going to be busy, but I got four people coming down here tonight. I just needed to know, did you want them here at 9.30 or did you want them here at 10.30? And she wow. just looks at me. And then bear in mind, I've not mentioned the names of the clients. And she looks at me and then just starts flipping through her chart to look for the client's names. I hadn't mentioned the names. She's just flapping. So I went, <laughs> hey, I don't want to disturb you. Again, I'm trying to be all cool and calm. I said, I don't want to disturb you or throw you off your curve. I just wanted to know when would be best for you because I know it's going to be a madhouse tonight. Everyone's going to want to be in this party. So you're blowing a little bit of smoke up about how good the party. Everyone's going to want to be in there. But what would, what would be best for you? For them to come early so they, meet, they get there before the rush or later on when the rush is over? What would benefit you? I'm showing that I care about her. And so she turned around, and I, I, I don't even know the time. She may have said 10, 15. So I went, thank you so much. you got a lot on your plate tonight. Now I'm flipping to empathy. you got a lot on your plate tonight. This is going to be crazy. You've got a big night ahead of you. So good luck. And let's be blunt. People are going to turn up, run in there, and they never pay attention to the people that control everything. So I just want to say thank you. So I pulled out. 400 bucks, 100 bucks for each person. I went, there you go. Tomorrow, grab yourself something to eat and a nice bottle of wine and relax and it's all over. Wow. <laughs> and she was like, wow, thank you. You see, I had shown that I was paying attention to her at the beginning by the time. Now I was showing relatability and empathy to her and then giving her a solution for something to actually look forward to tomorrow. She instantly went, what are their names again? And I rattled off the names and she wrote them on the front of the page. Okay. Wow. So, and she stayed in contact with me. She told me when all of her parties were going on. She told me where all of her events were going on. Now, here was the thing. On the door, I was only making between like five to 900 bucks a week. And I'd just given 400 bucks of it away. Okay. So I walked back to the club, walked into the door, walked up to the four boys. And I went, boys, I just made a phone call. I've got you into the party tonight. And they were like, really? And I went, yep, 500 bucks each. And that was it. And they paid. Wow. And as they left and went down to the party and then thanked me afterwards and then asked me where the next party they could go to, <laughs> okay? As this was all happening, I'm realizing that the more powerful and the more visible you get, the less you can withstand the embarrassment of being deter turned down, declined, or refused. So by coming to me, you don't have to suffer that embarrassment. Wow. Wow. So, so like early on, especially, you know, like some of these first gigs, obviously staying confident was probably a huge key to your success. So did you ever struggle with that at all? And then if, if you had anything you did to like boost um, your confidence? The old fake it till you make it thing, let's be blunt, is very accurate. Um, we all get nerves. Um, I race motorcycles, I do kickboxing, and I'm nervous as shit every time I step into a ring or every time I'm on that front grid and the lights are about to go green. I'm, I'm pissing my pants and I'm terrified, okay? 
but you can't allow it to control you, okay? It's not, it's not a crime to be nervous. It becomes a crime when you allow those nerves to dictate you, okay? That's where the real power is. So when I would go along to someone, I found the easiest way to get over and to give you this illusion of confidence in me was for me to be 100% transparent, not authentic, okay? Authenticity, yeah, it's a word I hate. It's like me celebrating that you've got two ears and you breathe. It, <laughs> should, be, it should be something you just take for granted, okay? The fact that we're freaking celebrating people for being authentic now, next year we're gonna be celebrating them for not being photoshopped or having <laughs> two legs. It's just bullshit. So the transparency is just being completely you, okay? People see me and they know that there's no hidden agenda because I've already told you I want to get into this party. There's no hidden agenda. You know exactly what I want. You know exactly the kind of person I am. And I tell you, you meet me in a party with, with the Oscars or you chat with me on this podcast, there's no difference. I am me and it takes zero effort to be me. So whenever I turn up to anyone, I'm like, hey, I want this to happen. I can benefit you in this way. And I also want to say thank you for making it happen. And I just keep it under those guidelines. Because if you enter any relationship, if you think of your buddies now, is there anyone, and you don't have to answer this, but if you think about your buddies, is there anyone in your circle of pals the kind of just bloody annoys you or doesn't pay up when the pizza comes or, you know, is a bit of a lame wad and doesn't... Tell them to fuck off. Okay? <laughs> you, need, you need to have value in every relationship. Every single relationship I have, there's value in it. Now, I've got relationships with my buddies still in England, not all of them, but a lot of them. And I guarantee you, and they know it, every time we turn up and we get together... I won't go to that bar because it serves crap food. I'll go to my bar and I'm the one that has to pay for the bar tab. I'm the one that has to pay for the food, okay? But they make me laugh. They keep me grounded. They bring value to me in other ways that are monetary, okay? So the value doesn't have to be, well, how much money are you making? How more intelligent? If you've got a buddy who just makes you pee your pants for laughter every night, that's value. <laughs> That's a good relationship. If you've got someone that at, that at one o'clock in the morning, you've broke down or someone stole your wallet and you need a credit card to be able to get home and you can phone that person and go, Jimmy, I need your credit card number, man. I can't get home and I need to book a flight. Okay. That's a person of value. Okay. If there's anyone else out there that's sponging, get rid of those and focus on those, on those uh, relationships you've had. They actually, once you've got that core group of people and there's no need to be anyone other than yourself in that circle, you'll find you can be yourself easier outside of it. That's so huge. That's it's something you never hear. And it's, it's something that people need to hear, especially with the money part. Yeah. Just, mm -hmm. I was just going to say, like, people always think that providing value means, like, they'll buy your lunch or something. But if someone can make you laugh and, like, take your stress away and make you feel good and happy, then that's someone you want to always have. Yeah. Around. I feel like the value of all that has just decreased so rapidly just with social media and shit like that. So it's well, we're guarded, important. aren't we? Again, it's back to the, it's back to the boxing gloves. We're so guarded because every day someone's posting on Instagram, just how way more perfect my life is than yours. <laughs> yep. um, and it's bullshit. And you see all these girls leaning over, getting an ass shot, leaning over a Lamborghini. <laughs> that they don't own, um, and it's just crap. And there's, there's no need for it. And the, the thing that bothers me is who are you trying to impress, okay? Because it's not me, and it's clearly not you guys, and it's clearly not most of the planet because we're all laughing at them. You look at the Kardashians. If there was a poll, how many people that thought these people were rocket scientists compared to how many people actually find them hysterical and laugh at them and just Google at them all the time, this poll's gonna be huge. 
You don't watch the Kardashians because you're going to become educated on philosophical science. You laugh at it. And that's the world that we're in. We're, we're guarded and no one's impressed by it, but we laugh at things. And so I want people in the future, and that's, that's why I did my book and stuff. I want people to start getting used to being you. And I want you to just go out, make relationships. And if someone frictions you, if someone gives you shit, hey, fair enough. We're not meant to be. Move along. I'll find other friends. And yeah, just be comfortable to do that. Yeah, I think a big problem, too, with people is, like, they, they, they think they have to be friends with everyone, and they think they have to be liked by everyone. And that's, like, just not the case, obviously. And then just to go back to your book, if you want to just plug in real quick information about that so that the audience is aware and can go – uh, find it if they want it, if they're interested in learning more about you. There you go. It's called Blue Fishing, The Art of Making Things Happen by moi, Steve Sims. It's brilliant. I think it's the next best thing since the Bible. So, <laughs> you know, I think everyone should buy it. But um, joking aside, before I say that, do you know, if you're thinking of writing a book, this book's actually a bestseller in um, a variety of different countries. I make 80 cents a book. So if you think you're going to be a billionaire by selling books, no. But so that gives you another opportunity. If you're thinking of writing a book, and I had this, write a book that you can be proud of. Write a book that you think will help people. Because financially, it's not going to help you a lot. But if you can get other people to change, that will help you. That's right. so true. That's awesome. Is it, is it on audiobook at all? Yeah, funny enough, I'll tell you this quick story if we got time. So I did the book. The book actually became really good. It was a bestseller. And then um, uh, Black, uh, I think it was Blackstone or something, um, wanted to uh, take the rights and turn it into an audio book. And they actually asked me if I would audition, get this, audition to read my own book. Okay? <laughs> so... Oh no, apparently a lot of people don't actually read their own books. They have other people read them. And I kind of thought that was a bit weird. So I actually auditioned and guess what? I got the job. Oh, um, congrats. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. And uh, so I, I did the thing and I walked into the, uh, the cubicle to do it on the first day with like half a bottle of whiskey and then just read the whole book. <laughs> and it was just hysterical. But yeah, so that's, that's all me doing the audio book. Um, I think it's cheap as shit as well. I think, it's, I think it's like $4.99 or $8.99 for the audio. And the audio has kind of taken its own legs. That's, I think the audio book sold maybe like four, four to six times more than the book. Um, I think people like the accent or something. If they yeah, they must have made the that. right decision, uh, letting uh, you know, proving the audition. But I was just going to yeah. plug in. For us, we are one of our sponsors is Audible. They're like the top audiobook providers. So if our if our listeners are interested, they can sign up through us and get you know a free version of your audiobook if they're interested. Oh, that's, that's perfect. So you even get it for free. So I think on my audio, I may make two cents. So I'm now bankrupt. But thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So. On to the next question. Um, out of anyone you've been able to interact with, what's like the coolest interaction you've had and why? Jean-Paul de Jouria, far, fast as a bat there. So, um, so yes, I've met some incredible people. Do you know who Jean-Paul de Jouria is? Nope. No, nope. no and that's, the, that's the thing. Most people don't, okay? Um, have you heard of Paul Mitchell, the hair products? Yes. Yeah, my mom uses that stuff. <laughs> have you heard of Patron Tequila? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Your mum probably uses that as well. <laughs> so, John Paul de Juria is the founder of all of these things and about 20 other major brands. Huge billionaire, okay? One of the most down to earth people in the world. And so, here's the story. When I was a bricklayer, my wife, we met when we were 16 and 17. She worked at a hairdresser's and she came home with these little testers of Paul Mitchell. Okay, it was the first luxury brand in East London that we'd ever noticed, ever seen, you know. Um, so for us, my wife being able to bring back these Paul Mitchell things and they all smell really nice. That was our first kind of, oh, this is how the rich people live. 
they have these fancy shampoos. And so I was at an event with a good friend of mine, Joe Polish, and Jean-Paul de Jour, I was getting coffee. And Jean-Paul de Jour here walks around the corner and no one, everyone else was in the event and I was outside getting coffee and he goes to walk past me. And I went, oh, uh, Jean-Paul. I said, <laughs> and I've got my cup in my hand. I hadn't even filled it up. And he's got about two or three entourage with him. And uh, he said, yes. And I said, it's a pleasure to see you. I said, uh, I don't know if you're busy, but I've got a funny story. I said, you're my first luxury brand ever, you know? <laughs> and I, I just started telling that. And he went, I'm so sorry, but I have to get on with some other things. I'd like to continue this conversation with you, but I have to, to go. And I went, oh, that's fine. You know, you don't expect them always to like, stand and talk to you, okay? And I thought to myself, he's just brushing me off. Fair enough. I've, I've congratulated him. I've told him he was the first luxury brand. I can go home and tell my wife and go, hey, you know, I met Jean-Paul de Jouy for like three seconds at the coffee <laughs> bar. And I just left at that. And I turned around and I started to make my coffee. And he's quite a big lad. He's actually an ex-biker. Um, you really should look up his life history. It's incredible. Um, and all of a sudden, I got this hand, quite a big hand on my shoulder. And I'm not a small guy. And he got this hand on my shoulder and I turned around and kind of like, you know, wonder who was, who was there. And he went, I finished. I believe you had a story to tell me. Wow. And I was like, damn, you know, you've, you've come back for that. So then he escorts us over so that we're not by the coffee machine. And I started telling this story and we're laughing and joking and we're talking about bikes and stuff like that. And I said, look, this is going to be pushy as hell. I said, but, I've, I've told you that it was my wife that introduced me to your brand. Um, can I get a picture to, to show my wife? And he jumps up. He's like, let's get it. So I, I took this selfie of me and Jean-Paul. And um, he went, show me the picture. So I showed him the picture. And he went, delete. That was horrible. Let's get another one. <laughs> and he wouldn't allow it to, uh, to be done until we were both happy with the picture. The guy took so much pride in the fact the people liked what he did. Now, here's the funny thing. I'm a whiskey guy, but the only tequila I have in the house now is Patron, okay? So that says a lot about, and I was at an event in uh, the Walt Disney Center in downtown LA uh, with a guy called Ryan Long, uh, an event called City Gala. He walked straight up to me and he's like, I have to be honest and I forget your name, but I remember our conversation. I went, Steve, he's like, it's good to see you again. And he just remembered. And he was just one of the coolest guys in the world. But his story and the way he interacts with people and his staff and life, that's a role model. That guy's life should be taught in universe. Everyone knows Elon Musk. Everyone knows Richard Branson. Everyone knows Bill Gates, Steve, all the rest of them. But Jean-Paul de Jouria should clearly be up there in the top four. Wow. That's yeah, amazing. we're definitely going to have to look into his story. Yep. Maybe get him on an interview someday. <laughs> I feel like I, yeah, I would want to reach that level of success just to be able to have those interactions like you were saying. Like, I would want to be known as the guy that takes his time out and talks to average everyday people and just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't happen a lot. Um, and he's one of the rare few. And it's, it's beautiful to see that he still, even today, does it that way. And I, I'm very proud that I, that I got the chance to meet and hang out with him a few times. Yeah, not like nothing's worse than meeting a celebrity or a famous person and then brushing you off and you just kind of have a worse view on them. Like you don't want to be like such a big fan of them anymore, you know? You get a chump feeling about you, don't you? You feel as though, can I, oh God, I liked you and, and now you don't. But then also, in fairness, um, it's very hard. Now, most of my people, most of my clients are very rich and unknown. They own things like countries and banks and, you know, those are the size. I, I, I took a client um, to uh, a hotel in Palm Beach, uh, not in Palm Beach, in um, Beverly Hills uh, a while back. And I said to him, I said, oh, why do you stay at this hotel? And he went, because I own this one. You know, you know those <laughs> are the people that, that I have as clients. Um, and when you meet celebrities, these celebrities, for the last three hours of the night, I've had everyone under the planet coming up to him going, can I get a selfie? Hey, I love your music. I love your film. And just because you're seeing them on TV three nights a week, you think you know them 
It's the first time now I've ever seen you. I'll tell you, I would never want fame. And so the fact that anyone actually handles it, I, it it's kudos to them. But it's, it's a very, very tough thing to actually handle. For sure. So out of all the requests you've ever like, tried to set up, what is the hardest one that you've been able to land? Hmm. Hardest one. Um, the trouble with the hardest one is that you've got to acknowledge it's hard. If I tell you, um, hey, go and do this tomorrow, it's, it's, you know, it's really hard, but, you know, ha have a go at it. You know, most people think it's impossible. You're starting to build up tension about doing it, aren't you? This apprehension. So whenever I do things, I just go in like a bull in a china shop. I just go running in. I go, hey, I need to do this. What have we got to do? And I just, and if I get a no, I'm asking the wrong question or the wrong person. Okay. And so I can, and then I will get, I told you earlier, I will get people that I know to make phone calls to make it happen. So we're going at different angles. There'll be three or four people phoning up this person going, you're going to meet this real weird fella from Britain. He wants to you to close down the museum and, you know, wants to bring in giraffes, you know, do it, you know? And so eventually you get it done. If you recognize things as hard, nine times out of 10, you get kind of tense and apprehensive. So there's been a lot of things that I've done that I've then stepped back and gone, holy shit, I can't believe I did that. You know, I had a client last year wanted to have lunch with Melania Trump, uh, not Melania Trump, um, uh, God, I can't believe um, uh, Obama's wife. How the hell have I forgotten her, her name? M Michelle, Michelle. In fact, Jesus Christ, Michelle Obama, yeah. He wanted to have lunch with Michelle Obama in the White House. Now, she's no longer in the White House, and he, he wants to be in the White House, but I pulled it off. Um, wow. And then afterwards, you just go, oh, yeah, I did that. You know, <laughs> oh, you know so it's just these kind of things that, that happen. Um, but afterwards, at the time, at the time, like when, whenever you've driven a car and the wheels have skidded, okay, what are you thinking of? Uh, holy shit, I might die. Uh, are you? This, this Usually is that's <laughs> what happens afterwards when you're puffing like crazy. Yeah. <laughs> but when the wheels are spinning or when you're gasping for breath or when you're in a punch up, or when something's going on like that, you have the single focus to survive and come out of it the other side. That's your, afterwards, it's like, yeah, yeah. I could have died. And that's when all the panic, panic attacks happen after the event. They never right. happen during the event. Right, because you, okay? you have too much adrenaline. You just can't. Bingo. You've got one sole focus, survival. So whenever I go and do something, I'm focused on getting it done. Afterwards, I've literally sat down there and... Uh, there's been a couple of times I've wept. There's been some times where I've just come out in a cold sweat. There's been some times where I've just kind of like just gone numb and not talked to people for a couple of hours and just gone, uh, they just spoke to that person and went off to play golf with that person on that. Cause, and it's just, and you look through your Rolodex, you get a phone call and you've got a phone back Jimmy and you scroll through your Rolodex for Jimmy and five numbers above Jimmy are all like famous people and five people below him are politicians. And you're like, how the hell is that in my phone? You know, <laughs> how, the, how the hell do I have wow. those people right. in my bloody phone? So how many contacts do you actually have in your phone now? Thousands. Really? That's, that's right. awesome. What would yeah. be the, the most like outrageous request anyone's ever asked for you, of you? To get married in the Vatican by the Pope. And it happened? We can't talk too much about it, but uh, I certainly got paid. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, we're gonna we're gonna have a request for you uh, when we get the money and we, we get the fame. We're get, we want to interview Trump in the White House. Hopefully, now you want you want the money. The you don't want the fame. Right. <laughs> you want the money. You know, fame. Fame's how many uh, Facebook likes you get, and the, the second you can pay your bar tab with Facebook likes, then I'll be impressed. <laughs> That's that's so true. <laughs> that's so true. Uh, so what were what were some of the like first you know like big name stars that you befriended yourself with? Like if you could recall some of like the first few. 
Um, I think friends is a very, very cautious term to put it. I, I have relationships with a lot of famous people. Um, yeah, I have relationships with a lot of famous people, but most of the time it's, uh, it's the checkbook that does the talking. As I say, most of the people that I know are very powerful, but they don't want to be known. Um, so a lot of the things I do very rarely make it into the uh, storybooks. Um, the, only reason, the only reason you're doing this podcast with me is because of the book. And so all of a sudden, in the past year and a half, people now know who I am. So now yeah. I'm getting a lot more of, of, of these kind of requests. So the celebrities, I would be very cautious to call any of them friends. And the reason I say that is I go back to uh, my credit card scenario. Who could I phone up at one o'clock in the morning? And that's not Brad Pitt. So, um, yeah. you know, I'm very, very cautious. We're in award season here now in Los Angeles. And um, in two weeks time, uh, I'm walking like the white carpet with uh, like Sir Elton John's Oscar party with all of his you know, celebrity friends and stuff like that. There'll be a lot of kind of, hey, Steve, I haven't seen you for a while. Oh, it's going to see, let's get a drink. There's a lot of those things go on and then yeah. you never see them again until next year and then you hear the right. same thing. Right. <laughs> That's incredible, though. You should definitely start like a YouTube vlog or something. I'm sure a lot of people would be very interested Yeah, like a TV show or something. It'd be sweet. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll start, we'll start a podcast, but the podcast, uh, yeah, the podcast will come out in a few weeks, but uh, it's not ready yet. Awesome. That's cool. So obviously you found your passion in networking and talking to people basically. So how do you recommend anyone in our audience out there try to find their passion? Yeah, if you try to find your passion, nine times out of 10, you'll overlook it. Um, passion is something that you can do easily. Passion is something that has very little friction. And passion is also something that fuels you. You know, we like to do a lot of what we like to do. So first of all, if you're really on the hunt for your passion, sit down and go, what do I really like to do? If tomorrow I have to do something, what could I do all day? Oh, I could knit, oh, I could cook, I could vlog, I could podcast all day. And then ask yourself the question, what if you had to do it at nine o'clock every Thursday for the rest of your life? Now, the second you take what you're passionate about and suddenly make it that you have to do it, it can become restrictive. So it's, it's tough. It's a very, very tough thing. The other problem you've got because of your age, and I've got this with my kids who are both, I got three kids and two of them are your age. The rest of society is telling you, well, what's your goal? What is your passion? What are you focused on? At your age, I was getting in a bar fight and uh, hanging out at biker bars in London. I did not think I would be walking into the Vatican with the Pope. So don't try to find the answer today. You know, just go with it. Enjoy it. Try different things. You can screw up to your heart's content at the moment. And it's not going to throw you out of your home because I would imagine you don't bloody have one yet. So, you know, just, just risk things, try different things, experiment with different things and just get that education of what you do like and what you don't like. You can make your lifelong decisions when you're 30 or 35, but you ain't got to worry about it now. Right. Okay. So you mentioned walking into the Vatican with the Pope, like how badass do you feel right in that moment? Like when you get to do <laughs> something like that? Uh, that was one of those moments where I came back and sat in my hotel room and I think I must have been there for a couple of hours just staring out the window just in a state of kind of like, uh, you know, <laughs> it was uh, surreal to say the least. So you yeah. mentioned you had kids. Have they ever made a request to you? Or? No, because, you know, they, they get to come along on a few different things. Um, my son wanted to play drums and we ended up having Matt Sorum from Guns N' Roses teach him how to play drums. So that was pretty cool. So, you know, they, they get a few little, they get a few little perks of having daddy, but nobody's kids ever think that dad's cool. You know, <laughs> yeah. they're just bloody, every, all the other kids go, Oh, but my kids are like, oh, no, he's an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> it's just what happened. Like, I, guarantee, <laughs> I guarantee you, you don't think your parents are cool. 
Sometimes, but sometimes. You know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So not as cool yeah. as you. Not as yeah. cool as you. <laughs> so when you interact with someone like the Pope, like how important is it to stay professional and kind of sophisticated, or how much can you like branch off and be your own self? And... <laughs> so can you imagine me trying to be sophisticated? <laughs> um, no, that's why we're asking. <laughs> yeah. No. Why don't you just try and be you? Because again, you can really keep that up for hours. There's no effort. So if I'm going to be in a room with someone. I don't care if it's going to be you two misfits or if it's going to be the Pope. It's still going to be a case of, hey, how you doing? My name's Steve. You know, it's just, just got to keep it normal. Definitely. So we, we recently interviewed uh, some, a guy named Peter Sage. Uh, he's like a British entrepreneur and, and was good friends with Richard Branson. Uh, and he said that Richard Branson, this is kind of off topic, but he said that Richard Branson was, was not a good businessman, but he was brilliant at hiring people that were good at business. So we just wanted to see your take on that and on that uh, hot take by Peter. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Peter's right. Um, there is, there's a real level of smartness and this is where Richard's genius comes through. Um, you don't need to know how you need to know who. And so if you want something done, don't go to college for five years to learn how to do it. Just bloody hire someone that already knows how to do it. Um, and that was Richard's thing. Richard, Richard was a great collector and um, uh, maestro at bringing people together that could facilitate and structure his vision. Um, and so, yeah, Vir Virgin has grown on the fact that he's been a great conductor of people. That's really cool. Really cool to get your insight on that. And then, and then our next question is something you just mentioned, which is college. So we just want to see your take on the importance of a college degree to Dan, how it's changed over the years. <laughs> I'm not quite sure you do. Um, <laughs> I, I think uh, there's a lot of people out there now putting themselves under a quarter of a million dollars worth of debt to get a college degree to be serving me a cappuccino in Starbucks next week. <laughs> um, it's true. It, it's a shame. There's a lot of ways. See, I class myself. I, I left school at the age of 15 years old. Okay. Uh, left age of 15 at 21 years old. I went to Hong Kong to work on the door. Um, and I saw so I had no college. I had no university, but I've spoken in the Pentagon and lectured at Harvard twice. I class myself as an educated man, but school had nothing to do with it. So college is not where you get the only education you will ever need. It's where you get some basics. And if you can get those basics somewhere else, go and find them somewhere else. But at the moment, college is used as a stepping stone to the ultimate job, when quite simply, the ultimate job may not be there in four years. You think about it, you're going to go to college and learn something for four years, okay? Just ask yourself this question. Anything you have in the room outside of your bed and chair and desk Will it look the same in four years' time? Nope. Yeah, you've got a boom in front of you with your mic on it. You've got headsets on. Yep. Will those headsets look the same in four years' time? Probably not. <laughs> no, your phone. Will your phone look the same in four years' time? Will your, will your laptop, will your screen? Will we com we're communicating at the moment over, what is it, Zoom? Yeah. Uh, we're on at the moment. Yep. And it's okay but it's not HD, is it? No. You no. Know? In, in, you know, like four years' time, we may be teleporting to bloody each other. <laughs> the point <laughs> is that the world is moving at such a pace, education's not keeping up with it. Especially and, for the price. Yeah. And the that's price the is moving past the education. Well, what people don't realize, and this is where it's getting ridiculous, is colleges are business. Schools are government. You have to go to school. So there's school subsidies. Colleges are a business. They want people in there that can make them look good and pay the fees. Okay? And then they will send you out into the world with a lovely little certificate and kick you on the way out. They do not give a shit once you've left that door. Yeah, right. right. So I am terrible. I used to speak at colleges, and then for some strange reason... They don't ask me to speak there anymore. 
<laughs> yeah, this this podcast, uh, the last two-minute rant will definitely help the case, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not going to be hard to speak there. So we, we're we wrapping up shortly because we've got to buy yeah. soon, yeah? Yeah, we got like yeah. a few more questions. Yeah. All right, whack them out and then let's go. All right, so I was just kind of wondering how big of a believer you are of like a personal timeline. Like sometimes people will look around at their peers and be like, wow, I'm so far behind. But in reality, they can be way more successful in the long run. So like, how do you feel about how everything plays out? Like maybe not everyone gets the dream job at 22. Maybe it happens at 30, that kind of thing. Like for you, you didn't finish school and then your big break came later on. So, Yeah, um, I was a complete retard that you would have ignored up until probably in my early 40s. <laughs> um, and you know, things just started to click. For a start, never look at anyone and compare yourself because you ain't the same. You two are different. All three of us are different. Just be the best version of you you can be. So, you know, you want to look at someone, stand in front of a mirror. Yeah, that's great. Awesome. So, so we're just going to go into the lightning round now. It's uh, three pretty simple questions that are just rapid pace if you could answer them as soon as you go can. Go for it. So the first one was, what is your best purchase of $100 or less? Um... Earbuds. I like listening to music all the time. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. If you could talk to your 18-year-old self for like 10 seconds, what would you say? Stop drinking the shit whiskey. Um, <laughs> I, I would never steer my younger self away from any of the fights, problems, um, being broke, downsides, depressions. I would not steer myself away from any of those because when you come out of those things, there's an empowerment, there's an education that you gain. Why would I be so disrespectful to uh, uh, allow myself to not have those? At the moment, I could wake up in the morning, I could be bankrupt, I could be living in a shelter, and I know what's necessary to get back out. And if, I, if my younger self avoided that, I wouldn't know. Yeah, so, that's, no, that's I wouldn't give myself any other advice other than to uh, don't drink the uh, shit stuff. <laughs> that's actually that's really cool to think about uh, and the last one here is what would you put on a billboard for the entire world to see um he didn't apologize he did <laughs> <laughs> wow that's that's great hold on my headset um but yeah that's i mean if, if you have anything to add christian that was brilliant um i hope we can stay in touch i mean we're hoping to grow our list of contacts to uh one day be as big as yours which is a tall test but we're gonna try so <laughs> Thanks yeah, for make time. it happen, boys. I wish you all the best. Keep me posted where this is. Send me any links and I'll be happy to throw it out. And if, uh, yeah, let's see how you do with this. And maybe I can introduce you to some people to be on your show. Definitely. Appreciate Definitely. it. Thank Steve. you so much. See Have you guys. Day. Bye.